Hi everyone, it's John. Welcome back to my channel once again. I have spent a lot of this year reading for Historathon, but every once in a while I have had just a, a craving to read a little bit of fiction. And one of the things that I read a couple of months ago was something I wanted to talk about. Of course, I eventually get around to talking about everything I complete on my channel. But uh, this had been sitting on my shelves for a bit. I think I found it at some, you know, book sale sometime. Uh, this is the Wordsworth Classic, Classics edition of George de Maurier's novel Trilby. And if that name looks familiar to you, I will... Uh, the last name, I will explain to you why it should be. So, uh, George de Moye, he lived from 1834 to 1896, and he is mostly known uh, for a couple of things. This book is probably his best known novel. All of the others are pretty much forgotten. Uh, he was a French-born English novelist, and uh, a cartoonist whose work appeared in the magazine Punch. If cartoons were all he ever created, I'm sure he would have gone uh, completely, you know, into the waste bin of history. But he had a good sense of uh, the good sense of having a child, who was the actor uh, Gerald de Moyer, who in turn had a child who was Daphne de Moyer, the author of Rebecca. So that's where you almost certainly know the name from. He, George de Moyer, uh, Daphne's grandfather, also had a daughter by the name of Sylvia Davies, who had five sons, and those five sons inspired J.M. Barrie's Peter Pan. So, uh, while, while George himself may not be terribly famous anymore, his, his descendants are uh, better remembered and uh, have inspired other people. Trilby was serialized in Harper's Monthly from January through August of, 19, of 1894. It was miraculously, uh, inexplicably, stultifyingly, one of the most widely read novels of its day. And if I'm already showing my hand as far as the review concer is concerned, I apologize. Uh, it revolves around three bohemian artists living in probably what is roughly 1850s Paris, all of whom have names which are just not to be believed. One of them is Taffy, T-A-F-F-Y, the other one is called The Laird, L-A-I-R-D, and the other one is called Little Billy, B-I-L-L-E-E. -E. I have no idea what's going on with these names, but that is just the, the tip of the iceberg, okay? Uh, they befriend a young woman, a uh, very young, sort of a naive ingenue type, named Trilby O'Farrell who occasionally serves as a human model for their art. And looming closely in the background figure, and why this novel is still remembered by anyone at all, is uh, someone whose name has come down to us as sort of an archetype of its own. Uh, his name is Svengali. He's the dark, mysterious, musician, creative, artiste, whose relationship with the characters has its marked ups and downs, but is always shaded a bit in mystery. A Trilby uh, is a bit on the unsophisticated side, and her tone deafness, I mean, when I say tone deafness, I mean literally her inability to sing in, t in tune, is a constant joke between uh, Trilby and, and the three artist characters. Svengali always dark, always bordering on the misanthropic, begs Trilby to uh, 
to help her become a better singer. But she's kind of disgusted by him. Fast forward five years. Uh, little Billy Taffy and the Laird attend a concert with a singer whose voice is among the most angelic they've ever heard. And surprise, uh, once they learn who it actually is, they're amazed. It's Trilby herself. Uh, Svengali has devised some sort of uh, way to exert his dark, malignant forces, his trance-like influence over Trilby. How does he do this, you might ask? Well, the answer, according to, well, he never really comes out and says this, but, I mean, <laughs> uh, it, it appears to be that uh, Svengali is Jewish, and that's where he gets all of his magical powers from. Uh, this, this allows him the power to sit in a dark corner and sort of twist his, his handlebar mustache and coax these sweet, dulcet tones out of someone who, just months before, everyone agreed couldn't carry a tune in a basket. And of course, I'm not even close to the first person who has commented on the overtly anti-Semitic impression this gives off. Uh, George Orwell probably was the best known of them have pointed out. I mean, this is just, there are aspects of it that are just unabashedly anti-Semitic. Uh, it's not exactly a central theme of the novel, but Du Maurier's description of, of Svengali is a, a problem, we would say now. Of course, he could get away with this 130 years ago. Uh, he's very eager to characterize Fingali as foreign, uh, overly cosmopolitan, and an intellectual. And those are all code words. Those are all... <laughs> that, that, that's just dog whistle language. And I think we all know that. Um, and he also sort of merges that with his ideal... Uh, with his ability to cast spells and entrance victims, uh, people that he's influencing with ease. It kind of rem reminded me of the way that a lot of 19th century writers used to write about African-American men in the minds of their white neighbors who were you know, overly eager, eager to, uh, to have sex with young white uh, 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 women and just the, the the absolute panic that would induce in their fathers and other white men um, it, it sort of has that same feel to it there's a, a rampant xenophobia which was much more common a century ago today uh, that's not an excuse it's just an explanation but that somehow doesn't really make it any easier to read all of this, I guess, could be saved to some extent if the writing was elegant or charming or beautiful. Instead, it is, and I promise I was looking for something redeeming here. I promise I was. It is some of the clunkiest, most ham-fisted purple prose I've ever read in my life. Uh... De Maurier, again, this is George here, not his much more talented granddaughter, makes you wait nearly 200 pages in a 250-page novel before he unveils the supernatural or creepy element about Svengali, which is really the only thing remotely interesting about the novel in the first place. There are entire conversations in the book, more than one, which are conducted mostly in French, or wholly in French. Uh, I would have gladly referenced the notes in the back for a translation, but my edition, again, uh, the Wordsworth Classics edition, didn't bother to provide translations of the French, likely because it knew that whatever was being said was even more dull in French than it would have been in English. But to read a synopsis of the plot, you would think that Svengali and Trilby are the centerpieces of the book. Instead, it's mostly taken up 
with the lives of these three artists who are, aside from being bohemians in 1850s Paris, relatively unremarkable people. Uh, in a year that has been thus far marred with more than its fair share of subpar books, this book was truly a nader. Uh, if anything, Trilby serves as a lesson that just because our great-grandparents happen to like something, that doesn't mean that we can or that we should. Again, this was one of the biggest bestsellers when it came out. It was fantastically popular. This might be the worst novel I've ever read, ever, uh, in keeping with my decade-long trend of refusing to give a one-star review. I've still never given a one-star review, despite the fact that I've written nearly 450 Goodreads reviews and have recorded about 400 reviews on this channel. This is one of the few books that I've given two stars to, and two stars is... For me, just abysmally bad. Uh, that's probably over, overly generous, and I was really considering one, but I opted for two. I've always been the, you know, there's something redeeming or redeemable in every book, but my gracious, he really made me work for it. And this is really just god-awful. Um, I'm not sure I would really recommend it to anyone. I don't like to be one of those people that just because I re read something and review it negatively that I would tell other people to avoid. But I think most people can probably safely avoid this. Unless you might be interested in fictional writing about uh, what anti-Semitism looked like 130 years ago or maybe what fictionalized accounts of... Uh, of bohemian life looked like back then. Other than that, I cannot imagine why someone would want to suffer through this. It was really, really a wretched reading experience. But I finished it, and therefore I am obligated to share my feelings about it. George de Maurier's Trilby. I will see you anon.